From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders around the globe. These are Cloud Native Insights. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman, the host of Cloud Native Insights. When we talk about Cloud Native, we're talking about how customers can take advantage of the innovation and agility that's out there in the clouds. Uh, one of the undercurrents, uh, you know, not so hidden if you've been watching uh, the program so far. We've talked a bit about serverless, uh, so something that's helping re remove the friction, allow developers to take advantage uh, of technology and definitely move really fast. So I'm really happy to welcome to the program, uh, have a, coming from Fauna, uh, first of all, I have the CTO and co-founder who is Evan Weaver. And also joining him is the new CEO, Eric Berg, who said both from Fauna, uh, talking serverless, talking data as an API, and talking the modern database. So first of all, thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having hey, us. Hey, good to be here. All right, so Evan, we're, we're going to start with you. I love you know talking to founders always. Uh, if you could take us back a little bit, uh, Fauna as a project first before uh, it was a company. Uh, you, of course, uh, were, were an early, uh, early employee at Twitter. So if you could just bring us back a little bit, you know, what, what created the Fauna project and you know, bring us through a brief history if you would. So I was, I was employee 15 at Twitter. I joined in 2008. And you know, I, had a, I had a database background. I was sort of a performance analyst and worked on Ruby on Rails sites at C -network, Networks uh, with the team that went on to found GitHub actually. And I went to Twitter because I wanted Twitter the product to stay alive and for no, you know, no greater ambition than that. And I ended up running the backend engineering team there and building out all the distributed storage for the for the core, the core business objects, tweets, timelines, the social graph, the image storage, the cache, that kind of thing. Um, and you know, this was early in the cloud era. APIs were new and weird. You, know, you couldn't get Amazon EC2 off the shelf easily. We were racking hardware in a co-location center and there were no databases or platforms for data of any kind that really let us, the Twitter engineering team, focus on building the product. And we did a lot of open source work there, um, some of which has, has influenced Fauna. Originally, Twitter's open source you know, was hosted on the Fauna GitHub account, which predated Twitter, like you mentioned. And I was there for four years, built out the team, basically scaled the site, especially scaled the Twitter.com API. And you know, we just never found a platform which was suitable for what we were trying to accomplish. Like a lot of what Twitter did was itself a platform. You know, we had developers all over the world using the Twitter API to interact with tweets. And we were frustrated that we basically had to become specialists in data systems because there wasn't a data API we could just build the product on. And ultimately, that data API that we wished we had is now Fauna. Well, it, it, it's a story we've loved hearing, uh, and it's fascinating one is that the marketplace wasn't doing uh, what we needed. Uh, often open source is a piece of that. How do we scale that out? How do we build that? Realize that the problem that you have is what others have, uh, and you know, hey, maybe there, there, there's a company. So uh, could you give us that transition? You know, Fauna as, as a product, as a company, uh, where was it understood that, hey, there's, there's a lot of other people that can take advantage uh, from some of the same tools that, 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 that you needed before? I mean, we saw it, you know, we saw it in the developers working with the Twitter platform. You know, we weren't like, you know, your traditional database experiences, either managed cloud or on-prem, you have to administrate a machine and you're responsible for its security and its availability and its you know, location and backups and all that kind of thing. You know, people building against Twitter's API weren't, doing that. They were just using the web interface that we we provided to them. And it was all our responsibility as a platform provider. We saw lots of lots of successful companies being built on the API, but obviously it was limited specifically to interacting with tweets. And we also saw peers from Twitter who went on to found companies, other people we knew in the in the startup scene, you know, struggling to just get something out the door because they had to do all this you know, undifferentiated heavy lifting, which you know, didn't contribute to their product at all. You know, if they did succeed, then they struggled with scalability problems and security problems and that kind of thing. Um, and you know, I think it, it's, been, it's been a drag on the market overall, where essentially 
you know, cloud services were, were, were more or less built for the enterprise, for mature and you know, mid-market and enterprise companies that already had resources to put behind these things. And there wasn't sort of the cloud equivalent of the web where you know, in, individuals, people with fewer resources, people starting new projects, you know, people doing more speculative work, which is what we originally and Jack was doing at Twitter, could just get going and build dynamic web applications. So I think you know the the move to cloud kind of left this gap, which ultimately you know is, is starting to be filled with serverless in particular. That you know we, we sort of backtracked from the productivity of the the 90s with the lamp era. You could do everything on a single machine. Nobody bothered you. You didn't have to pay anyone. You know just you know RPM install and you're good to go. To this Kubernetes containers cloud multi-site multi-region world where it's just too hard to get a basic product out the door. And now serverless has sort of brought that around full circle. And we see people building those products again because the tools have finally matured. Well, Evan, I really appreciate you helping set the table. I think you clearly articulated some of the big challenges uh, we're seeing in the industry right now. Eric, I want to bring you into the conversation. So you, you relatively recently uh, brought in a CEO, came from Okta, you know, a company that, that is also you know, do, doing quite well. So. Give us, if you could, really the, the business opportunity here. You know, serverless sure. uh, is you know not exactly the most, most mature market. There, there's a lot of interest, excitement. We've been tracking it for years uh, and, and see some good growth. But uh, you know, what what brought you in, uh, and you know, what, what what do you see as as that big opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the, the first thing I'll, I'll comment on is what, uh, you know, when I, when I was looking for my next opportunity, what was really important is to, um, you know, I think you can build some of the most interesting businesses and companies when there are significant technological shifts happening. You know, Okta, which you mentioned, uh, took advantage of the fact of, um, you know, SaaS applications really uh, being adopted by enterprise, which back in 2009, uh, you know, wasn't uh, wasn't an exactly a, a known a known thing. And similarly, when I look at um, at Fauna, you know, the, the the move that Evan talked about, which is really the the maturation of of serverless and and therefore that as an underpinning for a new type of applications is really just starting to take uh, to take hold. And and so then there there creates opportunities then for you know a variety of different um, you know people in that stack uh, to build interesting businesses and obviously the database is is a uh, you know is an incredibly important part of that um, and the other thing I'd mention is that you know a, a lot of people don't know this but there's a, a, a very good chunk of Octa's business which is. Uh, you know what they call their customer identity business, which is basically you know servicing up identity as a as a set of APIs that people can integrate into their applications. And you see a lot of enterprises using this as a part of their digital transformation effort. And so uh, I was very familiar with that that model and and how um, you know how prevalent, how much investment, how much pain was out there for customers as they were. You know, every every company becoming a software company and needing to you know rethink their business and and build applications, and so you put those two trends together and and you just see that you know serverless is going to be able to uh, you know meet the needs of a lot of those a lot of those companies, and uh, and, and you know and the, and you know as Evan mentioned you know databases in general and traditionally um, have come with a lot of complexity from an operational perspective. And so when you look at the technology and some of the problems that Fauna has solved in terms of really removing all of that operational burden when it comes to you know, starting with and scaling a, a database, not only you know, locally, but, but globally, um, it's, uh, it's sort of a no-brainer. No you know, every, everybody would, lo would love to have a database that, that scales, uh, that is reliable, that is secure, and that they don't have to manage. Yeah, uh, Eric, just a, one, one follow-up question for you. I, I think back a few years ago, uh, you talk to companies and it's like, okay, yeah, database is the center of my business. It's a big expense. I have a team that works on it. There have been, there's been so much change in the database market that most customers I talk to is I have lots of solutions out there. I'm using Mongo. I've got Snowflake. Amazon has flavors of things I'm looking at. Um, you know, Snowflake just filed for uh, the, their IPO, so we see the growth in the space. Uh, so maybe if you could just, you know, obviously serverless uh, is a differentiation. There, there's a couple of solutions out there, like from Amazon, uh, with their Aurora serverless solution. But how, how does Fauna, you know, look to differentiate? Could you give us a little bit of kind of compare to the market out there? Sure, yeah, so at the, at the high level, just to clarify, 
you know, at the super super high level for databases, there tends to be you know two types: operational databases and then data warehouse. You know, of which Snowflake is an example of a data warehouse. And um, as you probably know, the former CEO of of Snowflake is actually a chairman uh, of of Fauna, so Bob Muglia. Uh, so we we have a lot of good insight into that business. Um, but you know, Fauna is very much on the operational database side. So the other ha half of that market, if you will. So so really focused on being the the core operational store uh, for your application. Um, and you know, I think Evan mentioned it a little bit. There's been you know a, a lot of the the transformation that's happened. If we if we rewind all the way back to the you know early 90s. Uh, when it was Oracle and the you know Microsoft SQL Server were kind of the the the, the big players there, and then as those architectures basically hit hit limits uh, when it came to uh, applications moving to the web, you had this whole rise in, in a lot of different NoSQL solutions. Uh, but uh, those those solutions uh, sort of gave up on some of the the promises uh, of of a, of a of a relational database in order to achieve some of the uh, ability to scale uh, and the performance required at, at the web. Um, but but we required then a little bit more um, sophistication, intelligence, uh, in order to be able to, to basically create uh, logic in your application uh, that could um, make up for the fact that, they, that, that, those, that those databases didn't actually you know, deliver on the promises of traditional relational databases. And so enter Fauna, and it's really sort of a combination of those two things, which is, you know, providing the, the 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 trust, the security, the reliability of a traditional relational database, but offering it at as a service, uh, serverless, as we talked about, at the scale um, uh, that you, you you need it for uh, for a web application. Uh, and so it, it's a it's a very interesting combination of those capabilities that we think you know, as Evan was talking about, allows people who don't have uh, you know, large DevOps teams or very sophisticated developers uh, who can code around some of the limitations of these other databases to really be able to use a database for, for what they're looking for. What I what I write to it is what I'm going to read from it, and, and that we you know that we you know we 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 maintain that that commitment and make that super easy. Yeah, it's well, it's important. It's it's important to 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 know that. Yeah, you know, the part of the reason the operational database, the database for mission critical business data, has remained a cost center is is because the conventional wisdom, you know, was that something like Fauna was impossible to build. People said, you know, you you can't, you literally cannot in information science create a global API for data which is transactional and consistent and suitable for for relying on. For mission critical, you know, user login, banking, payments, user generated content, social graphs, you know, internal IT data, anything that's irreplaceable. People said, you know, there can be no general service that can do this ubiquitously at global internet scale. You have to do it specifically. So it's sort of like, you know, we had no power company. Instead, you could call up Amazon, they drive a truck with a generator to your house and hook you up. And you're like, right, right on. I didn't have to like install the generator myself, but like, it's not a good experience. It's still a pain in the neck. It's still, you know, specific to the location you are at. It's not getting utility computing from the cloud the way, you know, it's, it's been a, a dream for many decades that we'd get all our services through brokers and APIs and the web. And it's, it's finally real with serverless. So I want to emphasize that the, the phone of technology is, is new and novel and, and based on and inspired by our experience at Twitter and also academic research with some of our advisors like Dr. Daniel Abadi. Um, that's one of the things that attracted the Snowflake chairman to our company, that we'd solve groundbreaking problems in information science in the cloud, just the way Snowflake had. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and, yeah, please go ahead, Eric. Uh, yeah, I was just going to add one thing to that, which is, in addition, I think that when you think about Fauna, and you, you mentioned, you know, MongoDB, I think they're one of the great examples of, of database companies, you know, over the last decade who's been able to, you know, build a, a standalone business. And if you look at it from a business model perspective, the thing that was really successful for them is they didn't go in to try to necessarily, like, rip and replace in big database migrations. They started uh, in evolving with, you know, a new class of developers and new applications that were being developed, and then rode that obviously into 
sort of a land and expand model into enterprises over time. And so when you think about FANA from a, a you know a business and a value proposition, position, it's 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 take is harnessing the tech the technological innovation that Evan talked about and then combining this with a you know a product led bottoms up developer first uh, business motion that kind of rides this technological shift uh, into you know you creating a, a presence in the database market over time. Well Evan, I just want to go back to that uh, it's impossible uh, comment that you made. Uh, a lot of people that they learn about a technology and they feel that that's the way the technology works. Serverless is obviously often misunderstood from the name itself uh, to, you know, we, we had a conversation with Andy Jassy, you know, the CEO of AWS a couple of years ago. And he said, if I could rebuild AWS from the ground up today, it would be using all serverless. That doesn't mean only Lambda, but they're, they're rebuilding a lot of their pieces underneath it. So, you know, I look at the container world and we're only starting the last, you know, year or so talking about people using databases with, you know, Kubernetes and containers. So what is it that allows you to be able to have, as you said, there's the consistency. Uh, so we're talking about ACID there, um, you know, not worry about things like cold starts, which are a thing lots of people are concerned about uh, when, when it comes to serverless. You know, help, help us understand a little bit that, you know, what you do and, you know, the, the underlying technologies that you leverage. Yeah, databases, you know, are always the, the, the last to evolve because they're the, the riskiest to, to change and the hardest to build. And, you know, basically, you know, through the cloud era, we've, we've, we've done this lift and shift of existing on-premises solutions, especially with databases, into cloud machines. But it's, it's still the, the metaphor of the physical computer, which is the overriding, you know, unit of granularity, mental concept, everything. Like you mentioned containers, like, you know, we, we had machines, then we had VMs, now we have containers. It's, it's still a computer and the database goes in that one computer in one spot and it sits there and you got to talk to it wherever that is in the world, no matter how far away it is from you. And people said, you know, well, the relational database is great. You can use locks within a single machine to make sure that you're not conflicting your, your data when you update it. You can have transactionality. You can have serializability. But what do you do if you want to you know, make that experience highly available at global scale? And we, we went through a series of, of evolutions as an industry, you know, from initially the, the on-prem RDBMS Two things like Google's percolator scheme, which essentially scales that up to data center scale and puts different parts of the traditional database on different physical machines on low latency links, but otherwise doesn't change the consistency properties. Then to things like Google Spanner, which rely on synchronized atomic clocks to guarantee consistency. Well, not everyone has synchronized atomic clocks just lying around. And there are also, you know, there are issues with noisy neighbors and tenancy and, and things because you have to make sure that, you know, you can always read the clock in a consistent amount of time, not just have the time accurate in the first place. And Fauna is, is, is based on and inspired and evolved from an algorithm called Calvin, which came out of a body's lab at Yale. And what, what Calvin does is invert the traditional database relationship and say, instead of doing a bunch of work, on the disk and then figuring out which transactions won by, by seeing what time it is, we will create a, a, a global predetermined order of transactions which is arbitrary by journaling them and replicating them. And then we will use that to essentially derive the time from the transactions which have already been committed to disk. And then once we know the order, we can say which ones won and, and didn't win and which you know happened before, happened after and present the appearance of, of, of consistency to all possible observers. And when this paper came out, you know, it came out about a decade ago now, I think. It was very opaque. You know, there's a lot of kind of hand-waving exercises left to the reader, you know, some scary statements about how it wasn't suitable for things that in particular SQL requires. We, we met my co-founder, and, and, and I, Matt is Fona's chief architect. He worked on my, my team at Twitter on one of the database groups. You know, we were, we were building Fauna, we were doing our market discovery, our prototyping, and we, we knew we needed to be a global API. We knew we needed low latency, you know, high performance at global scale. We looked at Spanner and Spanner couldn't do it, but we found that this paper, you know, proposed a way that could. And we could see based on our experience at Twitter that you could overcome 
all these obstacles which had made the paper you know overall you know be, be neglected by industry and it took us quite a while to you know to, to to implement it at industrial quality and scale to qualify it with analysts and others prove to the world that it was real and you know eric mentioned mongo you know I, we did a lot of work with cassandra as well at twitter and we're early in the cassandra community like i wrote the first tutorial for cassandra before data stacks was founded you know these vendors were, were telling people that you could not have transactionality and scale at the same time that it was literally impossible and then you know we had this incrementalism like things with spanner and it wasn't until fauna that anyone had proved to the world that that just wasn't true that, that was more marketing around their, their failure to solve the information science problem than, than something fundamental eric uh, I'm, I'm wondering if uh if you're able to share just to order a magnitude you know how many customers you have out there uh from a partnership standpoint would like to understand a little bit how you work you know or, or you know fit into the public cloud uh, ecosystems out there uh i i noticed that alphabet's you know general venture fund was one of the uh c contributors to the, the last raise and uh the, obviously there's some underlying google technology there so if you could just customers and, and ecosystem yeah yeah so uh so as i mentioned um you know uh, it, we've had a very aggressive, uh, you know, product-led developer, you know, go to market. Uh, and so we have tens of thousands of people now on the service, uh, you know, using Fauna at, at different levels. Um, and now we're focused on, you know, how do we, how do we continue to build that momentum? Uh, again, going back to the model of, of focus on a, a developer, developer-led, you know, uh, model, really what we're focused on there is taking you know, everything that Evan just talked about, which is real and, and very differentiated in terms of the, the real core tech in the back end, and then combining that with a developer experience that makes it extremely easy to use. And really, we think that's the magic in, in terms of what, what Quanta is bringing. So we've got tens of th thousands of users and we've got, you know, more signing up every day, uh, you know, coming to, to the service. We have an aggressive, you know, free plan there and then, and then, and then they can migrate up to to uh, you know to higher paying plans as they consume over time. In the ecosystem, uh, in, in, you know we're we're you know aggressively playing in the the broader serverless ecosystem. So whether it's you know what we're looking at is as Evan mentioned, sometimes the the database is the last thing to change. It's also not necessarily the first thing that a developer starts from when they think about you know building their application or, or their website. And so we're plugging into the larger you know serverless ecosystem where where people are making their choices about you know potentially their compute platform or maybe a development platform. Like I know you've talked to the folks over at Jamstack and so Jam, or at, at sorry at Netlify and Marcel, uh, you know who are big in the Jamstack community and providing really great workflows for you know new web and application developers on these platforms. Um, and then at the compute layer, obviously, you know, Amazon, Google, Microsoft all have a, you know, serverless compute uh, solution. Cloudflare is doing some really interesting things out at the edge. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a variety of people up and down that, that stack, if you will, when people are thinking about this, this new generation uh, of applications, um, you know, that we are, that we're plugging into to make sure that, that Fauna is the, sort of the default uh, database of choice. Wonderful. Uh, last question, Evan, if I could, I love when I got somebody with your background, uh, talk about just so many different technologies um, maturing. Give us a little bit as to some of the challenges you see of serverless ecosystem, you know, what's being attacked, what do we still need to work on? I mean, ser serverless is in the same place that, that LAMP was. In the, in the early 90s, you know, we have the open serverless ecosystem with the Jamstack players that Eric mentioned. We have closed proprietary ecosystems like the AWS stack or the Google Firebase stack. It's, to your point, Google has also invested in us, so they're placing their bets widely. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, the same kind of criticism that LAMP, that, that Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, Perl got, you know, it's not mature, it's a toy, no one will ever use this for a real business. We can't switch from like DB2 or Mumps to MySQL, like no no one is doing that. You know, the, 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 the movement and the momentum in serverless is real and the challenge now is for all the vendors in collaboration with the community of developers to mature the tools as those, the, the products and applications being built 
on the new, more productive stack also mature. So we have to keep ahead of our audience, make sure we start delivering. And this is partly why Eric is here, you know, the, those, those mid-market and ultimately enterprise requirements so that businesses built on top of Fauna today can grow like Twitter did from small to giant. Yeah, it's, I'd add on to that. This is reminiscent for me of, you know, back in 2009 at Okta, you know, we were one of the early ISVs that, that built on uh, and relied 100% on, on AWS. You know, at that time, there were, there was still, it was very commonplace for people racking and stacking their own boxes and using Colo. And, and we used to have conversations about, I wonder how long it's going to be you know, before, you know, we, 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 we exceed the, the cost of this, you know, AWS thing and we, you know, we, we go in and, and run our own data centers. And, you know, that, that would be laughable to even consider today, right? No, no one would ever even, even think about that. And I think serverless is in a similar situation where, you know, the consumption model is very attractive to get started. Some people are sitting there, hmm, is it going to be too expensive as I scale? And as Evan mentioned, you know, when we think about if you fast forward to kind of what the innovation that we can anticipate, you know, both technologically and economically, um, it's just going to be the, the, the default uh, model that, that uh, you know, people are going to wonder why they used to spend all this time managing these machines if they don't have to. Evan and Eric, thank you so much. It's great to hear uh, the, the progress that you've made and uh, big supporters of the serverless ecosystem. So uh, excited to watch the progress there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks for having us here. All right, and I'm Stu Miniman. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, every week we are putting out the Cloud Native Insights. Appreciate it. Thank you for watching.